If you would, grab your Bible and let's open it once again, actually for the first time, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we're going to be winding down our study of this very special book. I hope it's blessed you and encouraged you to look at a, a very special church and how Paul taught of what made them special and how they could be even more special. So it's, I hope you've experienced that. In my reading this week, I came across a guy who said this, quote, our world is a diverse mixture of ethnic groups, cultures, languages, religions, and political systems. Diverse. Diversity. I mean, look around the room. There's a lot of diversity. So that got me thinking. So I did some Googling. Now, isn't that crazy? 25 years ago, if I'd have said that, you'd have looked at me like I was a nutcase. But I say that today, everybody instantly is on the same page. And I found out there are four distinct races, nine sub-races. I didn't know that. Over a hundred minor races and thousands of clans and tribes. In the country of Nigeria alone, there are over 206 distinct nationalities. Interesting. 6,909 distinct languages spoken. So ethnicity is defined as this. Ethnicity is determined by language, ancestry, culture, nationality, society. And mark my words, pretty soon it'll be sexual preference. <laughs> but the whole point is diversity, distinctiveness, difference. In fact, if you turn on the news, if you turn on one of those reality shows, if you, if you listen to the talk shows... This seems to be the buzzword of the day. Look at me, I'm different. I'm unique. Bible tends to contradict that. It, it, the Bible says that in spite of our uniqueness that distinguishes us as different, the Bible says there's really only one flesh of man, 1 Corinthians 15. There really isn't black, white, yellow, purple, green, or whatever people are trying to be. There's only one flesh of man. But within that flesh, the Bible says there are two classifications of people in the world. Only two. And it's determined by birth. We all had no choice in our first distinctiveness. We were all born physically, which means we were born in the line of Adam, which means we were born lost and separated from God. But the Bible says there's a great second opportunity afforded to all men. is to be born again. Born from the Spirit, born from above, born spiritually, where we are reunited to God and his life comes back into man. So the Bible says there's only two classifications, those that are in Adam or in Christ, those that are the redeemed or the unredeemed, the saved or the lost, the child of God, the child of Satan. Those who are in the kingdom of God are those who are in the kingdom of darkness, those who love God, those who do not love God. Those who are believers, those who are unbelievers, and as some have humorously said, those who are saints and those who are ain'ts. There's only one problem. If you meditate a little bit on that, there's nothing humorous about it. Because they share two different destinies. One eternal life, the other eternal death. Now, you have to ask at this point, what is it that causes this great distinction in humanity? Well, it's not really a what, it's a who. It's a person. His name is Jesus. He is the great unifier of mankind. Look around this room. We've got young, we've got old, we've got really young, and we've got some really old. <laughs> <laughs> We've got rich and poor and everything in between. We've got male and female, which is about the greatest difference there is on the face of the planet. And yet in the economy of God, we have all been brought into one body, the Bible says. One community that shares the same common life of Jesus Christ. He's the great unifier, but he's at one and the same time the great divider. He himself said, if you are not for me, you're against me. And so he came to earth once as a man so that he could die, offering himself a ransom to set us free from sin and death. Then he went back to heaven, wonderful, sent the Holy Spirit as another just like him with the promise that he would return for us one day to set up his kingdom on earth. But this time when he comes, he's coming in power. He's coming to reign as the king of kings. He's not coming as a babe. Now, at this point, he's going to gather all of us up together. That's what we saw last week. And what a special time that was, wasn't it? 
One of the most special passages I've ever come across. If you missed it, sorry. <laughs> no, you can actually go online and watch it. <laughs> Today we focused, last time we focused on those who died already and the hope that they have and the hope that we have. Today we focus on those who live. We're going to be in 5, 1 through 11. I want to put it up on the overhead for you and tell you where we're going. We're going to look in verses 1 through 3 at this second coming called the day of the Lord. And whenever you see that phrase, day of the Lord, it's always a reference to judgment. Two, our distinct nature, which a little hint means we're not going to partake of the day of the Lord. It has no part in our lives. Two, because of our distinct nature, we should have a distinct behavior. Because after all, we have a distinct destiny. And therefore, we should have a distinct devotion. And preacher school teaches you how to do that with all D's. <laughs> Paid all that money to go to school and learn how to do that. Let's read the first couple of verses. Would you stand with me? First Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly. That the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Father, we got some sobering words today that are going to wound our hearts. But we're also going to see some words that bless our hearts. And I pray that as we look at those two diametrically opposed thoughts, that we will walk out of here different from when we came in. Father, your truth is designed to transform us. And we want the world to see the transformation in our lives so that they can come to the transformer as we have done. So, Father, this is a great day. Pray you'll be our spiritual guide and teacher as we walk through it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, notice we said the day of the Lord always refers to judgment, but look what Paul says. Concerning the times and the seasons, two different words. Times has a reference to chronology, the date on a calendar. Seasons has a reference to kinds of time or signs, the what. And look what he says, you have no need to be instructed. You don't need to gain an answer. Why? Because you already know there is no answer. Disciples in Matthew 24 and in Acts 24, excuse me, Acts chapter 1, had asked Jesus, is this the time that you're going to set the kingdom? And what did Jesus say? It's not for you to know the times. It's not for you to know when I'm coming back. Look, every once in a while, we'll pick up a magazine or pick up a book where some guy claims a special revelation and he fixes a date when Jesus is going to come back. And most of them have had to throw away their books. <laughs> it's not only wrong, it's actually foolish to try to set that date. Jesus has already told us no one's ever going to know. We need to focus on what we do know. We do know that he's coming back. That's what we know. I was having this conversation with Morgan, and she said, you know, it's kind of hard on our faith sometimes. It's been 2,000 years, Dad. And I said, yeah, and we got to remember that a day is like, a 1,000 years is like a day with the Lord. Right? It could be 2,000 more years. It could be 40,000 years. Who knows? What we do know is it's imminent. And when we say imminent, we mean nothing else has to happen, which means he could actually come back in the next minute, which would be wonderful right? To enter into glory. Look what he says, verse 2. He says it's going to come like a thief in the night. Think about that for a minute. The goal of any thief is to catch the homeowner by surprise. I don't know of a thief that announces his arrival. Can you imagine getting home to church today and finding a note on the front door from a thief saying, I'll be at your house next Saturday at 2 a.m. It would really help if you put out your valuables. That's a dumb thief, right? Because we could set up a police trap for him. Now, Thieves come unexpectedly. That's the whole point. Jesus used the same metaphor in Matthew 24. He said if the householder had known in what watch the thief was going to come, he, the householder would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, be ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man's going to come. 
He's going to come at any time, and he's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. He's especially going to catch the unbeliever by surprise. Because the unbeliever is going to be looking, look what the verse says. They're going to be saying, peace, safety, everything's great, got money in the bank, kids are doing great, the job is secure, almost got the house paid off, great. Jesus says, man, at that moment, destruction's coming. And look what he says. This is a very important couple of words. We'll deal with this a little later. It's coming upon them. Not upon their deeds, but upon them. Now, how does he describe this? He says, like the birth pangs of a woman. Now, again, I read some people, and they looked at the birth pangs of a woman, and they started to read into this. Well, you know, a woman knows she's pregnant. And so then they said, well, then we can know signs. And then they started to predict the time based on signs. Stop that stuff. Jesus has already revealed very clearly no one knows The purpose of this metaphor is not to set a time. The purpose is to establish the inevitability of what's going to happen. The inevitability of what's going to happen is when the woman feels those birth pangs, that child is coming. Right? And and I saw it four times. Right? And there was a great desire, but there was also a little dread. (laughs) right? It's the inevitability of hopelessness. There's no escape. That pain's going to come because that baby is going to come. That's the point of this illustration. And he says, when that happens, look what he says in the verse. There'll be no escape. I shared with you last week that in my humble opinion, this secret rapture thing has been mistaught. I shared with you that it's really pageantry. It's loud. It's a worldwide call to attention. In my humble opinion, I think that's the graciousness and goodness of God giving people one last opportunity to repent like the thief on the cross. You can choose to believe that, not believe it. I don't care. But the point is this. This time, when that opportunity of faith is over, it's over and it's over forever. The time for repentance and faith will have passed. In the Greek, it doesn't come out in the translation, but there's a double negative. U me. And it should be translated this way. There will be no way of escape. None. Get the idea? No, not any. Double negative. The hammer of God's justice is going to fall, period, end of discussion. As I meditated on it, the words that come in my mind are too late. Too late. Like the parable of the ten virgins. Remember that? They did all their little stuff, and by the time they came, it was the door was shut, and it was too late. Too late. Too late. Very sobering words. That's why I love verses 4 and 5. But you. Contrast. The day of the Lord, this, this judgment, this thing that should properly be feared by unbelievers does not fear us. I was just talking with a woman this week, and she was talking about the future things and how she's so afraid. There's no fear for us. We don't have to worry about all that judgment. (laughs) Amen. Well, there's one. That's so exciting. (laughs) You don't have to fear the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look what he says. But you are... I love that. You are brethren. You're the family of God. You're not in the darkness. So that day's not over going to take you as a thief. Look at verse 5. You are. Those are the great verb. That's the Amy verb. That's the first verb that a Greek student ever learns. It's the state of being. It's the verb of nature. It's the verb of isness. It's the verb that's used of God. God is. Amy is. Love. God is, isness, light, nature, that part of him that cannot be changed. We got to be technical students here. It doesn't say God has love or God has light because if he has it, he might not have it. He might decide to be a little dark someday and squash you like an ant. That's not true. He can't do that because he has to function by his nature, and his nature is love and light. The great. A little delayed, but good. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> That's why we have a coffee bar. <laughs> 
We are nature now, sons of light, sons of day. Of is what's called a genitive of source. Our source is now light. Our source is now day. Our source is now God. Because God is the light of the world, what did Jesus say? We're the light of the world because he lives in us. Wonderful. By the way, I'm going to be a little technical. Did you notice he didn't say child of light? Now, we're child of God. That's used elsewhere, isn't it, in the New Testament? But we're dealing with specific context. Context is battle. We don't want to be children when we're in a battle. What does he call us? Sons. Those who have full stature. Those who are mature. Those who are in full standing. Those who have the rights of sonship. What he's saying is this, there's nothing more that you need to do. There's nothing more that needs to be done to you. You stand right in the eyes of God. You may feel wrong. Stomp on those feelings and live according to truth. You're not wrong. You're right because God says so. Look in that mirror and say, God says I am right. Wonderful, wonderful. We need to understand this. You ever, you ever, you ever seen that, that, that silly thing that came out of the, of the East, the yin-yang thing, where there's a circle and there's a little symbol and half of it's black and half of it's white? That's a bunch of yin-yang. <laughs> when it comes to you, it's all white, all pure, all righteousness. There is no darkness in your spirit and soul. Wonderful. That demands a response, by the way. (laughs) Because we can never be of the night or the darkness again. I want to hammer this into your heart today. So would you please stand? When we're done, I'm going to read for you three verses. In fact, I'm going to speak over you three verses. Okay? One of them is this one. And it's, I'm doing this because I want you to own this. I want this to be a once and forever day. So when we're done, I want a response. Be it a hallelujah or an amen or a clap or a shout. Make a noise. Give a holy grunt. Do something. <laughs> because this, this is too good to not respond to. We don't want to be like... The, the people in Matthew, you remember Jesus said, if those kids don't shout out, the rocks are going to start doing it. We don't rock the rocks to shout. The ones who shout should shout. Take a position of receiving. Put your name in this. But you are not in the darkness. The day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of... Oh, Frank, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. You are all. What does the word all mean in Greek? It means all. Bunch of Greek scholars. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness. You were born in Adam. But now you are light in the Lord. And now we come to this one. This is so cool. Give thanks unto the Father who has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his own dear Son, in whom we have redemption. We've been redeemed through his blood, even the forgiveness, watch this, Of all our sins. Of what? All All right, let the people shout. Hallelujah, right? Have a seat. We got a little more to look at. So this day of the Lord, we don't have to be afraid of because we have a distinct brand new nature. We are the saints. We're no longer an ain't. We are the righteous. We are the loved. We are the accepted. Wonderful. If that's true, verses 4 and 5, we should have a distinct behavior. If you're brand new, look what he says in verses 6 through 8. So then, accordingly, fittingly, logically, live brand new. 
If you're different from the world, act different from the world. Look what he says. Do not sleep. Now, pay attention here. You might want to circle that word. This is a different word from sleep that we used last week. Last week, that word sleep referred to death, physical death. This word refers, it's kathudo, it refers to callousness, carelessness, indifference. If I were going to illustrate it, it would be like falling asleep during class and not paying attention. Let me tell you what happened. (laughs) You know, I, I played a little football. Well, coming out of high school, I didn't get any major scholarship to a major university, so I went to junior college, but I didn't play ball that first year. Well, lo and behold, an offer comes after my first year of JUCO where I sat out a year from a major university called the University of Southern California Trojans. I know you may not like them, but in Southern California, they're a big deal. (laughs) Major television, huge crowds. So I said, well, of course I'd love to be a Trojan. I had a 1.8 grade average that first year. (laughs) So I couldn't get in. So I had to go back to JUCO, and so I started play. They suggested I play freshman ball, so I played freshman ball. I got my grades up, called them up, and they said, well, we already signed a guy last year. We don't need you. So now I root against the Trojans every chance I get. <laughs> but I also could not get a scholarship to major school and had to play for a D2 school. I missed out because I wasn't paying attention. Put that in the spiritual realm. If you're a believer, you don't want to miss out. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven if you do something stupid, which we all do sometimes. But it means you're going to miss out on experiencing heaven right now. Does that make sense? You can choose to try to find life out of this world instead of finding life out of God, and you're going to be missing out on what you could have had. And so he says what? Instead, be alert, diligent, awareness, watchfulness. Be sober means mature and balanced. In fact, I found a quote, and it was so good, I just got to steal it. The sober-minded person has a calm and sane outlook on life. He is not complacent, but neither is he frustrated and afraid. He hears the tragic news of the day. That's what it'll do. But he doesn't lose heart. He experiences the difficulties of life. But he doesn't give up. He knows his future is secure in God's hands, so he lives each day creatively, calmly, and obediently. That's a sober-minded man and woman. So be sober. Be alert. Those are active verbs. They're not passive. They're something that we have to choose to do. They're present tense verbs, which means we got to do this continuously. It's, it's like we're living in a minefield, baby. And if you decide to not be alert one day, you're going to step on a landmine and you're going to fall. You can't let your guard down. We can never let our guard down. One writer said this, our outlook determines our outcome. And when your outlook is uplook, then your outcome is secure. That's a good word. That's a real good word. As you're looking at planet Earth, make sure you're looking at it through the eyes of heaven first. See it through the filter of God. I ask people this question all the time when they're struggling with an issue. Is that life to you? Because a lot of times our biggest issue isn't really an issue because we're looking for that issue for life and we shouldn't have been looking for that issue for life in the first place. There's only one place to find life. 1 Corinthians 10. Look what he says. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's a warning to all of us. I read of a song leader. He said, okay, we're going to sing now, standing on the promises of God, and you need to take this to heart because too many people are just sitting on the premises. (laughs) That's a good (laughs) word. They're, They're not taking it to heart. They're not being active. They're not being alert and watchful. In fact, look at the language of verse 8. Paul said, let us all. Did you notice that? He included himself in this exhortation, the apostles. In other words, nobody's above falling. Nobody's above falling. I want to have the greatest compassion on earth for anybody that walks in my door and says, Frank, I'm so sorry, but I made a bad decision. 
And you know why I want to do that? One, because I want to be Jesus to them with skin on. But the other, what if I ever make a stupid decision? I want to have people give the same compassion back that they got from them. Now, that's not that I'm intending to make a stupid decision. I get warned about that enough from somebody named Janet. Now, look what he says next in verse 8. He said, put on your armor. Let's gear up for battle. I read a lot of people that said that's an addition to the text. It's foreign to the context. I don't buy that for a minute. When I think of the language here, be alert, be sober, be watchful. That's military. We, we call those people sentries, right? Guards. So this is exactly in the context. So look what the armor is. He says, first put on a breastplate. Well, let's think about a breastplate. What does the breast, breastplate protect? Your heart. Your most vital organ. Guard your heart. What does the helmet protect? It protects your mind. These are the two big issues of a Christian walk. You better set your mind in the right place. Because wherever it sets your mind, that's where your heart is going. This is where the battle rages for all of us. Look at a few passages I put up for you. Be transformed. How? Not by self-discipline. By the renewing of your mind. Romans 8, the mind set on the flesh will do the flesh. The mind set on the spirit will do the spirit. Colossians 3, set your mind on things above. Look at Proverbs 23. It's really the summation of all of them. As you think, so you're going to be. What you put in, what you're going to get out. Wherever you set your mind, that's where your heart will follow. When your faith is strong, your love will be full, and your hope will be secure. But when your mind is a-wandering, your faith is going to be weak, your love is going to wane, and your hope will diminish. It's just that simple. Christianity, if I could dare to say it this way, is a mind game. Only it's not a game. It's a battle. And in a battle, you better win or you're going to lose. It's that simple. So guard your heart and mind, Philippians 4, so that God will establish your heart. I shared this with you several years ago, but it's very powerful. And it fits the context perfectly again today. And since it was several years ago, most of you don't remember it anyway, right? Steve Green wrote this song back in the 1980s. Anybody there, you date yourself. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes old things are really good things, right, Don? Amen. This is what he said. What appears to be a harmless glance can turn to romance. Homes are divided. Feelings that should never have been awaken within, tearing the heart in two. Listen, listen, I beg of you. The human heart is easily swayed and often betrayed at the hand of emotion. You dare not leave the outcome to chance. You must choose in advance. Or live with the agony of such needless tragedy. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure. Don't give it away. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay. For a soul that remains sincere with a conscience clear. Can't put a price on a clear conscience. Guard your heart. So my friends, we've seen that the day of the Lord is coming, but we don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear it because we're not a part of that. We got a brand new nature, brand new you. We're sons of the light. Got nothing to do with darkness. If that's true, then live like it. 
Live in the light. Don't live in the darkness. Because not only that, look at this one, verses 9 to 11. We got a different destiny. We have a different destiny. Verses 9 through 11. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to the attaining of salvation by our Lord Jesus, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You know, I've been studying the Bible for a long time now. And two of the most sobering truths that I have found is this. One is that God gave man free choice. You know, sometimes I think, boy, Lord, it'd be easier if I didn't have to confront choice. To just live robotically. That wouldn't be love. You know what else? That wouldn't be life. Robots are not alive. So that's a sobering thing that God gave man free choice. But even more sobering than that is that God will honor your choice. I'd like you to turn to see this for yourself in the book of Romans. About five books to the left, six books to the left. And go to chapter 1. Look what he says. Verse 18, for the wrath of God, right, there's a very sobering phrase, the wrath of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That which may be known of God is manifest in them. There's something in every man that knows there's a God. I've had some great discussion with people who think they're atheists. You know, I, I know something about you. What's that? You believe in God. No, I don't. Hey, deep down, the Bible says you do. You suppress the knowledge. Why? Because if there's a God, you're accountable to him, and you don't want to be accountable to him. You want to do your own thing. It's known. And the invisible things of God are seen from the creation. Every man can look at what's... Look at this beautiful Louisiana and those cypress trees and those beautiful swamps. And I guess that's about it. <laughs> and you can say there's a God. It's eternal power. They're seen. Look what he says. Verse 20. Every man's without excuse. When they knew God, they glorified him not. They don't want a God. They're not thankful. If there's a God, they're accountable to him. So they become vain in their imagination, and their hearts get darkened, and they think they're wise, but they're really fools. And then they start changing the glory of God into an image made like corruptible man, and they start worshiping men. I get people in my office all the time. I have to tell them they're an idolater. I'm not. They're worshiping their spouse. They're worshiping their kids. They're worshiping themselves. And do it all the time. And so that brings wrath. So the point is when men choose against God, when men choose death and reject life, God will honor that choice. And he says wrath is going to come upon them. But we need to define wrath because God's gotten a bad rap. Think of him as up there with a big old hammer knocking the snot out of people. It's not it. Wrath is not rage. I don't believe wrath is even anger. Wrath, I would define it as this, God's settled determination against all that is not of him, against all that is not good and right, against all that is evil. You know what? We want him to have wrath. Because contained in wrath is holiness, and contained in wrath is justice. And God is not God if he is not just. But it's not this out-of-control rage. It's simply this. You made a choice to stay in death and try to find life in death. I, I will honor that choice. You can have what you wanted. It's all it is. So when men choose to step into sinfulness and wrong and error and against God, they're just choosing to step in what, to what God has already determined he's against. That's why Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. It's a very sad thing, isn't it? 
There's a lot of people today trying to do away with wrath in the Christian community. That's not teaching the whole counsel of God like Paul said to. I don't like it. In my heart, I'm a universalist. I want everybody to be saved. But God is never going to violate the human will. He'll do everything he can to shape it and win it, but he'll never violate it. He's too much of a gentleman. But let's not end there. <laughs> let's end where Paul ends on the glory. Isn't that much better? Look at verse 9. We're not destined for wrath. <laughs> we chose God's predestined way. God's appointed way for man to find life is a person named Jesus, and we chose Jesus. And this is so cool because God's way is the easy way. It's not hard. I hate religion. Religion muddies the waters and makes it difficult. Okay, now you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to cut your hair and wear your pants and do that. Stop it! Stop it! God made it easy. He said in John 12, when the Son of Man has been lifted up, I'm going to draw all men to myself. And the context there is about the serpent in the wilderness. Tell me about the serpent in the wilderness story in Numbers. They're wandering in the wilderness. What are we doing? We're wandering in the wilderness. And along the way, there were fiery serpents that bit people and they died. And along the way, there's a fiery serpent out there and he bites us and people die. See what Jesus is doing? He's taking the Old Testament and pointing to a greater reality. So the people cried out to Moses. Moses cried out to God. God said, hey, let me make it easy. Build yourself a little brass serpent, put it up on a stick. Anybody get bit by the serpent? All you got to do is look. He didn't say you got to crawl on your knees for a thousand steps to a temple. He said, just look. And in the moment of look, in the glance of faith, you're healed. You're healed. Why do we want to make it difficult? I hate religion. I'm studying Revelation. We're going to teach Revelation pretty soon. And by the way, I'm just going to let you in on a little something that I think this is what Revelation's about. First of all, it's not about future things. It's not called the Revelation of Future Things. It's called the Revelation of Jesus. And I think there's two things in there. There's a beast and there's Antichrist. Right? The beast, I'm going to tell you in advance, is government's. Government is a beast that suppresses people. And Jesus is not about suppression. And so this is about Jesus' victory over government. And there's an antichrist. You know what antichrist is? I don't believe it's a person. I think it's a spirit. And it's called religion. And the book of Revelation is about Jesus' victory over religion. And it's finished. Hallelujah. There's one. We're going to have fun in that book, I think. But I'm not ready yet. I've got a lot more to learn. Glance at me. Have you been bit by the serpent? Just glance at Jesus. And in your glance, there's redemption, healing, restoration, forgiveness. You know who did the glance of faith? This is ironic. The thief on the cross. Isn't that weird? In this context, there's a negative thief, but there's a good thief. The good thief gave the glance and found life. And so hear the heart of God today. Please hear the heart of God. It's from Ezekiel 18. God says to all those who've been bit by the serpent, why will you die? Why would you do that? Did you hear that? God does not send anybody to hell. He honors the choice of men to send themselves to hell. God says, why will you die instead of choosing life? Why will? See, he's drawing all men. Men are rejecting the drawing. Why would you do that? So we've seen the day of the Lord, a day of judgment, a thief in the night. We don't have to worry about that. Because we have a brand new nature. We're not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, we should have a distinct behavior. We live from the light. Because we have a distinct destiny, we have life with God. By the way, did you notice that sort of formed a sandwich? There's behavior, but on either side is what? A new nature and a new destiny. <laughs> so live a new life. 
And he wraps it up by saying, and have a distinct devotion. You see, here's a very important point that I want you to walk out with today. When God gives us knowledge of the future, it's not so we can know the future. Fred, when you go to work tomorrow morning, it's not for you to stand at the watering cooler and say, did you know there's a day coming that's going to be judgment? (laughs) I'm in the know. It's not what it's for. It's not what it's for. Peter said this, because we know these things that are going to happen, what manner of people should we be like right now? We are told the future so it can change our present. That's the point. And what is his point then? How, what's our present to look like? What's, what are we supposed to be? Look at verse 11. What does he say? Therefore, here's the conclusion of everything we said today. Comfort yourselves together and build each other up, even as you're already doing. Love each other. Strengthen each other. Encourage one another. I like Philip's translation. I found this as I was reading this week. Go on cheering for each other and strengthen each other. Isn't that a cool word? Cheer for each other. When I met Janet on a Saturday night, I was teaching a conference and she was attending. And we grabbed for the same chair and I went, ooh, baby. <laughs> you know what I found out in our dialogue? She was a cheerleader. And she cheered against me in college. (laughs) Isn't that horrible? (laughs) But I decided to forgive her. And now she cheers for me. Be a cheerleader. What What a great goal in life. Gang, there's more than enough critics in this world. There are so many people out there that are so stinking negative, always looking for something wrong and pointing it out. Those who are, don't do that. They're, they're, be an encourager instead. Be, be, be one of those who make your life's work to build up others. I, I've taught you this before. There's a study that was done that for every negative comment we hear, we need to hear 10 positives. And so mark it. I'm going to get a negative today. So I need at least about 10 or 20 of you to come up. So well, that was really good. <laughs> but what if we made it our life's mission to be one of those? Man, Dennis. You parted your hair great today. (laughs) Find something (laughs) and tell them. Be a Barnabas. A Barnabas. Barnabas was the son of encouragement. But did you know that Barnabas was not his real name? Does anybody here know what his real name was? A slip? (laughs) It's Joseph. Well, then how did he get the name Barnabas? The apostles looked at the way the man lived in Acts chapter 4 and said, you know what? He's such a bar son, Navas, encouragement, that it became his name. Can you imagine living the life of an encourager so much that everybody decided that's your new name? And by the way, look what he said. You're already doing it. Now do it more. When I saw those words, you're already doing it. I thought of Grace Life Fellowship. You're already doing it. People, I talk to people who visit this place. And they say, man, the people here. They reached out to me. I've been visiting churches. I walk in, sit down, leave. Nobody even notices me. I had one person tell me they couldn't get out of here one day. Everybody was all over them. You're already doing it. Now do it more. Here's the words we walk out with. Look for what's right in someone and praise them for it. Boy, if we just put that into practice, we're going to turn the world upside down where we are in this city. So be it in Jesus' name. Go.